So welcome to everyone joining us here from different parts of the world. We are very pleased to have this webinar today where we are launching the IAU magazine, IAU Horizons. It is a magazine that we publish twice a year uh, at the IAU. We have a part of the magazine that is devoted to our activities. You will find information about the outcomes of the 16th General Conference that we held in Dublin last year, some information about the upcoming uh, con international conference taking place in Doha this year, hosted by Qatar University. You will also find articles uh, related to our strategic priorities, internationalization, sustainable development and digital transformation. But what we are here to talk about today is the second part of the magazine, which is our in focus. And this time we have decided to place focus on the future of internationalization in a changing world. And in the magazine, we are very pleased to present 25 papers from different parts of the world with multiple uh, perspectives, thoughts around the challenges and opportunities for the future of internationalization. We would have wanted to bring in all the authors, of course, for this conversation about the future of internationalization, but as it's not possible, we have um, we are very pleased to have here a great lineup uh, with some of this, the, the authors considering different parts uh, of internationalizations in their papers. And then, of course, we invite you all to download the magazine and to discover the full set of articles uh, in there. I will now hand over to Giorgio Marinoni, uh, with whom I have uh, published this uh, magazine. We've worked on this uh, together at the IAU. Uh, and he will take you through the next part of the session. Yeah, thank you very much, Trine, for the introduction. It's a pleasure for me being here with all of you and having uh, a great panel of very distinguished speakers um, that I'm going to introduce very quickly. Um, but before doing that, I would like to uh, explain you how we came to the creation of this panel. Uh, as Trine said, it was impossible to invite all the speakers that all the authors that produce very relevant papers for the edition of IU Horizons. So we thought to present you during this webinar a selection based on the following logic. The first speaker, who is Eva Egron Polak, former IU Secretary General and now IU Senior Fellow, will introduce the topic giving a global perspective to the idea of internationalization and the future of internationalization. And after that, we will move looking at internationalization from a different angle. First, we will start with teaching and learning, then we will move to research and partnership, and then we will move to uh, students and the relation between internationalization and societal engagement, and especially students and local communities. So for the first part, the first speaker will be Betty Lesk, Emeritus Professor of Internationalization of Higher Education from La Trobe University in Australia. As I said, she will uh, take the angle of internationalization of teaching and learning, and especially internationalization of the curriculum. After that, we have a couple of distinguished colleagues, Divinia Gito, specialist of international education, and Laverne Samuels, director of international education and partnerships. Both of them are coming from Durban University of Technology in South Africa. And as I said, they will look at the topic of internationalization of research and especially partnership and even more uh, in detail, they will look at the theme of equality and inequality in partnership, in, uh, in international partnership. And last but not least, absolutely, we will go to Sara Tagliabracci, Global Mobility Coordinator of Erasmus Student Network. And as I said before, she will look, she will bring the student perspective and looking especially at internationalization and societal engagement. So I'm really pleased to uh, start this session, but just one technical information. You will be pleased to ask questions in the questions and answer function that you can find in Zoom. I think all of you are familiar. You can ask questions at any time, but our panelists will reply to them after all the presentations. So we will go for the for the whole set of presentation, and then we will have a whole question and answer session where we will select some questions if many, or uh, hopefully there will be many. And we will pose the question to our panelists and they will be very happy to start engaging in a debate with you. 
You can also ask questions in the chat, but it will be easier if you use the question and answer function in order to track them. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Eva for the introduction of the topic from a global perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Giorgio and Trina, and uh, good morning to everyone. Good morning, at least in our part of the world. I'm speaking to you from the Western part of uh, France. Um, I first want to thank IAU for inviting me to, to join this panel, but also to congratulate um, the association on the magazine because it's it has um, really brought together very interesting articles that each and every one of them has something that you take away uh, uh, from from reading it. So I would encourage everybody to uh, to read the papers um, in the IAU Horizons. So the question, what future for internationalization? Let me start perhaps by saying that I don't think it's about predicting what the future is, but rather about really planning for it, a deliberate um, consideration of all of the developments and factors that influence policies um, to create a deliberate strategy and an approach, while at the same time being ready to um, adjust and to switch to plan uh, B, C, and D as needed. I think we've all learned that from the past uh, three or four years of experiencing COVID. Second, I think it's really important for um, us to move from the rhetoric of recognizing that in the past we've made errors in the ways we've carried out internationalization. And in fact, we continue to um, make ongoing uh, errors or mistakes, problems with uh, internationalization that I think we all know um, include being too commercial, um, focusing way too much on uh, mobility and in particular mass recruitment of students, um, on mobility that has been one way rather than a multi-focused um, multi, um, mobility. We have noted poor sharing of benefits, uh, the risks of cultural homogenization, and all of this has been recognized in, in, in policies and texts, but I think it's time that we move to policy and action that really meet the aspirations um, that we espouse to, seeing internationalization as a way to quality, uh, making it accessible, uh, mutually beneficial, et cetera. And I think one of the things that we really have to understand is that the past, and even the current reality is experienced very differently in different regions of the world and by different socioeconomic and racial groups locally. So it's not just understanding um, some of these errors, but also recognizing how they have impacted and colored the way internationalization is perceived elsewhere. In my view, um, in all their missions, higher education institutions now have a responsibility as never before to address societal and environmental challenges, both globally and locally. And for me, the key challenges are um, to create a more just, equitable and inclusive world, which may lead us to a more peaceful society, um, invent and apply sustainable development practices in all spheres of human activity. So we actually ensure our long-term survival and harnessing technology for the public good so we can avoid unintended consequences and actually create more inequity rather than address it. And I think meeting these goals must become the, a part of the way we define quality of, or excellence. And internationalization strategies must align and fit in within these broader institutional policies. And in fact, they must inform them because they are internationally um, 
nourished and um, targeting an international or a global engagement. And internationalization that is fully linked and integrated into such higher education efforts becomes a means to pursue um, equity, diversity, and inclusion policies, part of the SDG strategies of the universities that most institutions now recognize as part and parcel of their responsibility. And such internationalization makes careful use of technology as a supportive tool, not a replacement tool, but a supportive tool in all the dimensions um, in the planning and delivery of internationalization. Standalone internationalization policies have become uh, very valuable and have become quite commonplace. But I think we have to make certain that standalone policies do not mean siloed policies. For me, being a part and parcel of uh, the overall institutional strategy and being coherent with those is really uh, very important. We've seen in the past some tendency to compete uh, for attention, for resources among different policies, but it is really important that we create a coherent set um, of strategies. And in my view, um, such inter internationalization alignment with broader institutional goals requires that we focus a great deal more on being inclusive in terms of student recruitment, in terms of the access we provide to international experiences to all students, as well as in our hiring and promotions policies. We need to be much more uh, conscious of choosing a diversity of institutional partners for our collaborations, um, not just looking at um, institutions that are like ours or that are um, as well reputed as ours, but actually making certain that we work with all kinds of partners. And I think we need to adopt practices uh, with a much lower carbon footprint and technology has made this a little bit more possible. And finally, I would say that we need to encourage and facilitate at every level of our institution, in the classroom, the administrative offices, laboratories, boards, a respectful and open dialogue that leads to actual learning and listening uh, to different viewpoints and perspectives. And all of this requires policies and practices that are self-critical, values-based, and have a, a long-term horizon. We're not in it for the short term. I think internationalization um, is part and parcel of the development of higher education uh, into the future. So that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, for this very comprehensive introduction of the concept of internationalization at global level. And uh, it's now with pleasure that we move to um, uh, more detailed perspectives. And we start from Betty Lesk. Betty, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, and my thanks also to the organizers and also, of course, to um, Eva for her um, Terrific introduction, and I think you'll see some common themes coming through in what I'm saying, but hopefully a little bit more um, depth uh, and detail in the teaching and learning space, which is my job today. Um, but I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I sit today, the Gauna people of the Adelaide Plains, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I recognise the Gauna people as the traditional owners and custodians of the land and waters of South Australia. It's my great pleasure today to discuss with you one of the key issues, what I see as one of the key issues in the internationalization of higher education today, and an area where we actually have to do those three things that um, Ava finished off um, summarizing so well, being self-critical of our past approaches, being values-based and having a long-term horizon. Those three things are absolutely critical 
to everything that I'm going to say here, and I think you'll see that come through. Um, in my paper, I argued that um, internationalization of the curriculum should have, must have a post-pandemic future, but that it needs um, to be rethought, that we need to um, think differently about what we mean by curriculum and what we mean by internationalization. I probably problematized past normalized approaches to internationalization that while having significant value, nevertheless, had some negative consequences for many. Privileging a minority of students, and if you consider the number of students who are able to access higher education, and then the number that are able to access um, mobility experiences within that, you're looking at a, a minute proportion of the world population. And we've had others that are focused much more on economic rather than educational goals, I think for both students and institutions. So a focus on employability, um, whilst it's a, a worthwhile goal, cannot be and should not be the only focus we have. We need to be thinking about how we're developing students as human beings and social beings as um, citizens of the world as, as well as citizens of their local communities. So I think it's time we, in effect, democratised internationalisation, provided um, high quality international education experiences to all students at home in their classrooms, on campus, in their local communities, and for those who have the option to travel, that's fine, but let's make sure that everyone as that baseline and that it's not a low base, it's a very high quality experience. There are a myriad of practical ways in which this goal can be achieved. We've been talking about them for 10, 15 years now. I've been talking about it for more than 20 years. And I'm happy to discuss um, at another time what those detailed um, activities might be, but in the immediate future, I think there are two big things on which much of the future depends, whether we're going to be able to do this rethinking and take a turn in a slightly different direction. The first big thing is our true commitment as a community to two related goals. The first is providing all students with that access to a truly international intercultural education experience for the particular purpose of um, not only improving their individual lives, but on how they might contribute to the lives of others in a super complex, globally globalized world that is simultaneously more connected and more divided as, uh, as we see today. So that purpose of them contributing to the global common good um, is a grand scheme but it is also what something I think the institution can certainly focus on. How do they contribute to the global common good through the education they provide to their students? In other fora, I've argued that this um, goal can be achieved by um, focusing on developing students' cosmopolitan mindset, skill set, and heart set. That where cosmopolitan means having an understanding of themselves in the world, underpinned by a deep respect for and consideration of others, diverse others, whether those others be indigenous peoples in their own local communities or people um, and as well as people in other, in other parts of the world. They need to have an openness to new ideas and different ways of thinking. And this needs to be developed as part of their total student experience in the formal curriculum and in the informal co-curriculum. And this can be done by providing a wide variety of active learning experiences. What we know about teaching and learning is that students need to be engaged. They need to have their hearts and their minds and their skills engaged in class, on campus, in local communities, utilising all available technologies and, and what we know about learning, what some people call tricks of the trade, but there's nothing tricky about them. Learning is a science, a study in its own right. We know how students will learn. 
The second big thing on which I think so much of the future depends is our ability to work as a global collective to establish internationalization of the curriculum at home for all students, um, which has until now been on the margins as a new normal for internationalization. This will require collaboration and negotiation on a small and a grand scale, um, which we might best approach as boundary crossing work. Um, and here I think we need to also recognize that whilst this, this is a big vision, there are easy places to start. And within institutions, uh, I suggest the need, there needs to be a really strong focus on preparing and supporting staff, both academic staff and um, staff across the institution involved in supporting teaching, learning, research and service. We need to support them to understand their role in internationalization and to um, uh, ensure that um, the uh, many stakeholders and key actors that need to be involved to deliver this agenda are involved and are supported. This means inspiring them and this means inspired leadership and commitment from leadership. It also requires working across traditional internal institutional boundaries between education, for example, and service, between research and education and between research and service, bringing all those agendas together to coalesce around this goal of um, uh, dealing with, uh, and, and on the way, dealing with what will be inevitable foreseen and unforeseen challenges um, that uh, will be faced. So those challenges might include, for example, um, how to engage those who design global ranking systems that drive so much of our collective behaviour and uh, yet privilege some sorts of activities around internationalisation. We need to think about how to engage the wider society in this new normal approach. How might we use service activities and the service agenda as part of internationalising the curriculum to develop students as global human social beings? Um, and I, might, I think I'm almost out of time. To conclude, I'd just say that research that I conducted in Latin America in 2021, 2022, um, with, um, of course, uh, Latin American colleagues, we uh, found the, um, identified the importance of really having time to discuss some of the philosophical as well as the practical agendas related to rethinking internationalization in um, the future world. And that involved talking about how students and teachers values will impact on teaching and learning, um, how to design curricula and how to teach uh, for diversity, how to be respectful oneself in the way one organizes a curriculum, how we know what we know and whose language, whose knowledge is privileged in the curriculum and whose, whose is missing. And what does it mean to be in the world um, as a student, as a teacher, and as a person? So these are all important and complex issues to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betty, for this very inspiring introduction on the concept of uh, uh, internationalization in teaching and learning and how uh, there are different means that can make this internationalization of teaching and learning beneficial not only for the individual but for the world society and more equal and inclusive. It will be a very long and interesting discussion uh, to go on on this theme, but we need to move to another one and we will have time, hopefully afterwards, for some question and answer from the public, which can again come back to you and ask for more uh, clarifications or uh, more uh, inspiration on this theme. And now it's with great pleasure that we move uh, from Australia to South Africa. And uh, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Divinia and Laverne. Please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Giorgio. Uh, greetings, colleagues. I know we're in numerous time zones uh, today, so I'm not going to say good morning or good afternoon. I'd also like to thank uh, the IOU, the organizers, and uh, also express what a pleasure it is for us to be presenting today with such esteemed colleagues uh, on this IAU Horizons webinar. Um, I'm Laverne Samuels. I'm the Director of International Education and Partnerships at Durban University of Technology. But I also bring the lenses of the other organizations I work for. I'm the President of the International Education Association of South Africa and the Chair of the Southern Africa Nordic Center Board. Uh, my uh, collaborator today, Davinia Jithu, is a specialist in international education and partnerships at Durban University of Technology. In our article, we explore inclusion and plurality of participation uh, in the COVID pandemic period and in the evolving post-COVID period. Uh, we hone in on inequalities in partnerships and collaboration in the internationalization of uh, research, and we focus particularly on the impact um, and implications for the global south and particularly for the African continent. Uh, many of our presentation needs graphics, so we will be using slides, but in the interest of time, Divinia will speak to uh, our slides. Over to you, Divinia. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samuels, and to all the colleagues for the introductions. Um, in our article, Fostering Inclusivity in the Internationalization of Higher Education, we have really highlighted the need for inclusive measures for participation in research and development um, and through international conferences for those from the Global South and um, or the developing world, and particularly from Africa. Um, in our article, the first illustration that we've included has been taken from our World in Data uh, Statistics in 2017, which details the global rate of research participation. The figure outlines global participation in research and development, indicating representation per region as of 2015. Um, the image shows that uh, the Global South, and in particular the region of Africa, engagement in the conception or creation of new knowledge, products, processes, methods, or systems are far less than that of the regions such as the USA or Western Europe, both largely considered to be representative of the global north. The second figure in our article reiterates the proportion of authors per continent and also highlights the low rate of contribution from the global south including Africa. And these low statistics are a result of historical coloniality and oppression that has manifested in higher education and research. A recent book published in uh, Ghana entitled Who Counts? Ghanaian Academic Publishing and Global Science has highlighted the challenges faced by African higher education systems, institutions, and academics in the neoliberalized global academic publishing space, controlled largely by corporations, organizations, and higher education institutions and scholars from the global north. In referring to the domination by a small handful of global companies, the authors of this book have used the term bibliometric coloniality, which refers to bibliometric, um, bibliometric indexes from the global north, which seldomly indexes journals from Africa. And this has rendered the majority of African journals and knowledge produced on the continent invisible on the global stage. On the other hand, um, in a recent PhD study, researchers have highlighted that international conference organizers are interested in presentations that focus on Africa, accessing opportunities to disseminate research, presenting and submitting papers for conference proceedings is a welcome stepping stone to participating in research and development globally, and in turn elevates the perspectives from Africa. However, the limitation now is that participation in international conferences is dependent on large amounts of funding, because of the high costs of not only travel, but conference registration costs as well. During the pandemic for us at uh, the Durban University of Technology, 
participating in international conferences and contributing our voice and perspective to the global body, body of knowledge became easier um, and more accessible because of the online mod modalities. Now in a post-pandemic world, the opportunities are limited to the face-to-face -face opportunities that we can afford, which have decreased due to budget cuts and the increased cost of travel and then the hybrid options that we now that now has also become few and far between. Um, in 2022, Dr. Samia Chasi and Dr. Savo Eleta, I see Dr. Uh, Chasi in the audience with us today. They argued that in the interest of inclusivity and equality, returning to the pre-pandemic only face-to-face -face international engagements may be irresponsible. Our article argues that in the interest of positive development for countries in the Global South, participation in research and development is imperative through inclusive, comprehensive and holistic internationalization that is now more possible through the technology mediated opportunities that are at our fingertips. By increasing opportunities for participation, the benefits reach far beyond the university. We have ended our article with the call to further unpack the concept of inclusive and holistic comprehensive internationalization that can be pursued through more supportive modalities that prioritize inclusion, inclusion and equality. By exploring these ideas, the objective of the internationalized mindset beyond the university, especially in the developing world, may be possible. Thank you. Thank you very much to Laverne and Divina for this very interesting presentation and also talk provoking and uh, telling us that unfortunately it seems that even after the pandemic, we have not learned everything that the pandemic could have taught us and still we are going back to some practices that are not equal and especially are still discriminating um, the global south. So this I think it's a very interesting point of discussion in order to see how uh, we could improve in the future. And now it's with pleasure to move to the last, uh, but uh, definitely not least of uh, the presenter in uh, today's session. So uh, Sarah will introduce the concept of internationalization and societal engagement from a student perspective. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hope you can see me and hear me well. Um, first of all, I'm Sara and I'm here as a representative of Rasmus Student Network. And first of all, I wanted to thank you all of you so, so much because it's very important that I think there is also the representation of actually a student organization here and also like to give um, what are our ideas on the future of internationalization. So I won't take more time and I will go uh, talking about who we are and what we do and then a little bit more about our article. Um, so we are like the biggest student organization uh, and alumni organization in all Europe. We are now active in 44 countries because actually the country that you see in pink are the new countries that we are. We have now uh, part of the Erasmus Student Network. We are co-located in 520 local organization connected with more than uh, 10,000 um, um, higher education institutions. What are the pillars of our activity? Um, we do have have three uh, main pillars, which are student support and engagement, outreach, outreach and promotion and reintegration. So basically what we do is um, in the part of the student support and engagement, we try, of course, um, to, to support the local organization uh, through the um, to a program that is called body system so we try to we match students that actually for example did already a mobility um to the people that actually will go to the outgoing students uh, and the support is very very important in case of the students of course with fear opportunities um background special needs and also all the people that actually need any help in regarding of the student support um and maybe they have some doubts regarding the future mobility um outreach and promotion because of course we what is our aim it will be to connect international students with the local communities in the moment they are doing um, they are doing their mobility through many many initiatives um, and then uh, reintegration which will be of course our one of the our key values so of course 
all the people that then did a mobility, uh, what is our aim is that they come back to their local society and of course they try to engage with the local society in order like also to reintegrate and to help their integration of uh, students that went uh, on a mobility abroad and then they come back in order like to, um, to give to the society uh, many, many values such as one of the unit in diversity. Um, the data that we use it for the pre this presentation and data we'll, we use for the article were from two, um, the first one were from two surveys. The first one is called the ESN survey that actually, uh, a spoiler that I give to you soon, that will be delivered the new ESN survey. With this survey, we actually collect all the needs, all the challenges, all the um, doubts that actually students have uh, carry when they carry a period of mobility abroad, and also uh, students that actually uh, maybe want to go mobility, but actually they are from uh, different backgrounds, um, fewer opportunities, and so that's why they have some challenges and some issues. Uh, same with social inclusion engagement in mobility research. Um, we did a huge research about um, all the challenges that actually students may face on their mobility, and actually also in the article we talked about all the barriers that actually students face. So what we think, of course, is that uh, we should have an enrichment of society through the international student mobility. So how do we make sure that communities benefit from international students? We care on international, internationalization for all, so internationalization to be uh, inclusive and accessible for everyone. We know that actually this, um, these sentences are really, really easy to say, but then it's very difficult to put them in action. Um, that's why with the, all the, um, the results we managed to have through the ESN survey and the CM survey, now we have uh, all the answers we wanted in order like, to think about some recommendations to give to international students. We know that the problem is that the international students don't always manage to integrate in local society, so usually they manage to have more multinational friends than local people. And also, their engagement cannot take, be taken for granted because I, as we see from these graphs, unfortunately, they tend not to uh, engage with the local communities and also nor with the local um, uh, international, international associations. Um, we think that actually the interaction with the local communities should be the heart of the international experience. That, that's why we uh, also in the in the article we talked about community engagement so what can be like you know the future um of all this uh, but as ESN we actually have um uh, an answer regarding all of this because actually we can create the uh, global citizens through the mobility because actually what it, what we found out during the um, during the um, the surveys is that actually people feel encouraged and when they go on mobility when they come back they're actually more active citizen but the problem is that how to make them integrate more than in the local community when they come back and of course they develop also multi-layered identities through the internationalization actually they bring they they feel they are closer to the other students and actually uh the problem then is the gap that how to connect them with the local realities. Um, in the article, we also talk that the future of internationalization is also internationalization at home. Uh, that's why, like, we know that many, many people can have uh, challenges, of course, due to uh, fewer opportunities background, for example, only talking about uh, the amount of, like, you know, the money that actually is needed to go on mobility. So how, you know, to try to um, fix this kind of problem. We know that this is like a partial solution, but of course, virtual mobility can be an idea and also blended. Actually, we see from the graphs that also blended mobility, actually people feel a little bit more integrated. So that can be an idea to make people more integrated in the local society. And of course, what we think is that, yes, of course, um, internationalization at home and virtual mobility is key, but all the activities should be more dynamic and more interactive for the students. Because of course, the quality of online activities and learning should be like, you know, um, have uh, support also depending on uh, what is like the situation that we have right now. We have all, this, um, all these tools that we can use, so why cannot we use it? Um, and then, of course, what we think is that international students' network are important, not only ours, but actually many, many others. And networks can create this space for mutual learning and to help the people coordinate and try to do more bottom-up uh, initiatives, which are like 
the future and what we think. Um, also have a common direction allows to have a co more coordinated impact because we actually think that if all international students network would have the same ideas on, for example, the international um, engagement, that of course we should create um, a space that is actually uh, more recognized for international students. And so basically I want just to close uh, saying some key points. So what we think about um, all of this. So what is our idea is of course that we should prioritize more benefits for the community in order like to uh, get more awareness to the uh, international students and also to the local students about intercultural dimension, how to make them feel a more uh, citizen of the world, but at the same time, how to engage more with the local communities. At the same time, we think about student led um, uh, processes and also that the students, if possible, as this time that for me is a very, very cool opportunity. As students, we can give more recommendation. We should engage more also with higher education institutions and try to make students more empowered uh, in order like to give um, more outreach to the local society. Um, what is our uh, thought is also like to involve more community actors in the design and implementation. Of course, one of our dreams would be to have more like a um, leading role also in the implementation and in design of the, for example, mobility programs and how, you know, to reach all kinds of students. Put the recognition at the center because ECTS and not only we know that all kind of recognition is key in order like to engage students and to make students even more recognized in the work that they do because actually um, they, they are the future of internationalization and of course promote the international dimension of the local student activities through the networks which we think it's like the best uh, the best way in order to ensure that the future internationalization will be brighter um, for everyone. So to conclude, uh, we know that internationalization brings many benefits to, to, to this to this society. So why not working together also between institutions and civil society organization to facilitate this process for internationalization in education. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And if you want to reach me out here, are all my contacts. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this very self-critical somehow also presentation on, uh, on the role of students and, uh, and the role of students in local community and, uh, and bringing also some concrete data through a very important project that uh, ESN is conducting, which is the ESN survey, but also with positive attitude on how to improve the situation and improve the integration of students, international and local students, and the work of students with the local communities. So I would like, with this, I would like really to thank very much all our speakers for having brought very interesting perspectives. And now we can definitely open the floor for questions and answer. And also to the panelists, please don't hesitate if you want to pose questions to yourselves. That's also a possibility if you would like to have clarification and stimulate a debate. But of course, priority would be for our participants today to ask questions to our panelists. So I see there are some questions that are already coming, but I would like to kick start first with a question from um, my colleague Trine, and then we can uh, start with a question from the, with the participants. Thank you very much, Giorgio. And I would like to echo you and thank all the speakers for their introductions and for putting uh, some of the challenges and opportunities out there on, on the floor for, or the, the table for us to discuss today. Um, I would like to start by going back to your presentation, Eva, giving us this uh, open, um, more global uh, perspective. And I think both you and also Betty mentioned this idea of moving beyond mobility in the focus on internationalization. And this, Betty, you were saying you've been speaking about that for 15 to 20 years. But the question is, why is it so difficult to move beyond? It took a pandemic to literally physically stop mobility, to force institutions to think about alternative measures. So my question is maybe why around, what are the key challenges actually that prevent us from creating this deliberate strategy, Eva, that you were talking about that allows us to ensure more inclusive internationalization, not without mobility. I'm not questioning the benefits of mobility, but I'm trying to respond to this 
idea of inclusiveness and the opportunities that we also have within the institutions with internationalization at home uh, that could contribute to this aim. So Eva, do you have any thoughts about those challenges that we need to address? I know it's not an easy question, but I think um, that's where we would start the conversation. Thank you, Trin. Um, I'm going to start, but I'm sure Betty will have um, uh, quite a few uh, additions to this. I, I think there are at least three or four major factors that have led um, to, to mobility being the centerpiece. I think it starts with the whole um, notion of Erasmus moving around the world. We had in the in the 90s become so enamored with that imagery of uh, internationalization is not new it's something that universities have done forever we focused on mobility as the um, light motif if you will or the right lightning rod for the whole phenomenon the last couple of weeks i've been thinking as i've been thinking about this presentation i've been thinking maybe we need to go back to our um, not our definition, because I think definition is only one thing, but to the way we conceive internationalization. Um, and I go back to Jane Knight and I sitting somewhere and she was drawing a wheel with a lot of spokes and all those spokes were of different dimensions. Well, I'm beginning to think that such dimensions as mass recruitment of international students for financial reasons should be taken right out of the definition. That isn't what internationalization is. And to the extent that we keep that part of it, we're doing ourselves a disservice. The second thing is that we're stuck with indicators, with quantity, quanti quantitative indicators. And what's easier to do than count bums on seats? We have so many students. We don't even look at where they come from, while well, we do look, but the number is the key um, that we show our policymakers because that's what they have integrated into their policies, but that we also compare ourselves um, according to uh, uh, um, with others. And the final one, which is not the easiest one, in many countries, the way higher education is funded is so dependent on the revenue generated by these international uh, students that unless we begin truly to see how to cut that dependence, how to change the way universities and higher education institutions are funded, um, we're stuck. And I think um, US, Australia, Canada, UK, we've those countries have led the way to seeing international mobility as a means to, to resource other activities. Um, and I think those three factors for me are really the major challenges to overcome. So um, I'll leave to Betty the other many, many that exist. Thank you very much, uh, Eva. Very interesting indeed. And Betty, you are very welcome to come in here and share some of your thoughts on this sure. question. So, so for me, one of the biggest issues that I have faced in the work that I've done is changing the way that people think about the work that they do. And that means that as a collective, as this kind of global collective of international educators, we have to somehow shift the way we think about internationalization. And whilst we've had and we've been listening for many years to um, dissenting voices from the kind of status quo, we haven't really done very much with it. We've said a lot about what we believe and what should be happening. Uh, my very first conference paper in, 2000 and, uh, in, in 1999 was at the an IDP conference, uh, which was focused on the recruitment of international students. And I got up and I was so nervous, I was shaking because what I was saying was, this is not internationalization. 
This is not what we should be doing. You are not internationalizing campuses by bringing international students onto campus. It's not going to make you more international. Look at the data, look at the research. And it strikes me as very odd that institutions like universities who are research driven do not look at that data or they look at the same data year after year and they don't do anything about it. They kind of shelve it and say, well, it's really hard. We can't do that for these reasons. So we're not going to do anything. So I think there's one thing is that, and is that as a collective, we are beneficiaries of that largely. So it is about rethinking how we strive. Eva, Ava, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to say one other factor that I think is really critical is that changing how faculty teach and yes. embrace yeah. international yeah. perspective yeah. is the most difficult thing to accomplish. It takes time, it takes to professional yeah. development, it takes a mindset. That's the other factor that makes moving away from mobility as a keystone of internationalization so difficult because it really is a, a cultural shift um, mm. of, our, of our way of teaching and learning. Um, and that's, that's, that's hard. And, and so, yes, it's incredibly hard, but there are pockets where it's happening. And so, you know, the, the kind of, the, the good thing is to think about how we can leverage off those. And so I think there are some good steps that we can take. So it's changing our thinking. It's changing how we act. But also I think, I mean, I find it interesting that um, since uh, once, once Europe started opening up, in fact, Europe started opening up well before we started opening up in Australia, it was almost instant the way that my international education colleagues just got back into it. It was like... Whoa, at last, we can go to conferences, we can meet people. And, and the things that uh, Davinia was talking about, where suddenly, if you're not in, dare I say, not just the global north, but if you're not in Europe and that kind of space, then you are, you were locked out because suddenly the time zones become tricky as well. So how can you, you know, I'd be asked to speak at things at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, because I couldn't travel, I'm going. Well, no, I'm not. Go I'm not going to do that. No, <laughs> I'm not. But if you held the session at a different time in the day, oh no, the co the program's already set. So we've set the program to suit the majority, and we want you know people from different time zones to come in at different times. So there, it is. It's it's absolutely about thinking about how we can stop and. And, and kind of take stock and turn around and do things slightly differently. It's not to say that mobility is not good. I, I hate, I don't want people to think that I don't think mobility is an amazing thing and that the work that Sarah is doing is fantastic. But we need to look at that, I think, um, more broadly in institutions, which is where they have most power. I mean, most power is by the teacher in the classroom. That is the most powerful person in, in the international education sphere. Um, we need to perhaps harness students more to, to put pressure on some of those um, academic staff and some of the university um, management people who are making poor judgments based on wrong assumptions about what internationalization actually is and how positive an experience it is for students because I know for many international students it's not positive and this all speaks to the quality of the education that's being provided and if there's not a focus on quality and there's not a focus on what research into teaching and learning tells us is quality in teaching and learning then it, it, it's, it's a wasted endeavour and it's such a wasted resource that is I think um, dividing the world more. Thank you very much, uh, Betty. And I, I think that this is uh, very important. And I think that we are not necessarily questioning uh, the usefulness of mobility, but trying to figure out how to reshape the focus 
as well at the institution and what changes can be done at the institutional level to ensure more in, um, inclusive internationalization as part mm -hmm. of the educational offer, of course, centered uh, in quality that's uh, important. Laverne, I would also like to, to give you the floor and react to this conversation uh, with your perspective from South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Trine. Um, I think uh, for me, the commercial drive uh, behind the, uh, mobility and the branding of mobility that gives esteem to mobility uh, compared to other aspects of internationalization is so powerful a force that it's really difficult to counter. I often compare it to the, the role of the pharma industry in healthcare. Their role is so powerful that all the talk that we have around wellness and uh, avoiding pharma where we can and contributing to alternative approaches to health often are ineffective because of the powerful drive of, for, uh, of pharma where um, you know, the pharma industry is seen as the be all and end all of healthcare. And in a similar way, uh, academic mobility has this role within internationalization. I think we re really need a coalescence of the committed, those that want to see a more balanced approach to internationalization. And I agree with everyone, mobility has a role, but it should not be the dominant force that it is. And in Africa, we have no choice but to look at alternatives. Uh, with, with all the um, funding in Europe, Europe has never reached 20% academic mobility around its students. In the US, this is between seven and 9% in good years. In Africa, this drops to under 1%. So when we actually give this esteem to internationalization, we should actually acknowledge how non-inclusive it is and where our commitment to the other 99% should be. So when we look at internationalization more broadly, it really is a commitment to the other 99 or the 92% of students that need this. And of course, for the development of our staff, because it's equally important for them to have this inclusivity in internationalization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laverne, uh, for these important inputs as well. Sarah, before we turn to the next uh, round of questions, do you also want to react here to this conversation about the balancing between this dominant trend of focusing on mobility and then seeing how we can actually change things from the institutional side and make internationalization more inclusive through internationalization at home? Well, it is a very difficult question, um, like also on the perspective of students' um, engagement. I can talk not only on behalf of my organization, but also as me, as a person that did three Erasmus mobilities, three of them very different between them and in three different places with also like a different um, like um, economic uh, situation. Because of course, um, as you told before, internationalization is not inclusive. And it's not like I totally agree with you. It's true. That's why, as student led organization, we want to empower like students and we want to, to tell them just like a very simple sentence you have the power, actually. It's only a little bit difficult, you know, because I think the main problem is that, of course, we cannot hope in a future in which all the organic, all the, um, all the decisions are student led. But of course, having even a little bit of involvement of student organization or at least a student movement inside the institutions that can help also to give a different perspective, a different overview. Because just a simple example, I did my mobilities, for example, the one for studies. The first one was in 2017 and this, the last one was in 2021. The Erasmus Plus program changed and now is more digital. My first one, mobility, was with learning agreement and had a ton of uh, documents to bring to Spain. In my last mobility, I did everything through the um, the OLA, uh, the online learning agreement, and that was for me amazing. But at the same time, for example, my home university in Italy didn't use it. So there was this gap in between universities because one of them, for example, in Paris, they were using digital um, learning agreement, but for example, in my hometown, they didn't use it. So I think this has to be like not a process that of course helps only like 
super developed uh, cities, but also like, of course, every kind of city that also has like, for example, universities that have all Eche. So of course, if they are available to receive and to send uh, students, why not to send them all in the same level, you know? So this is a thing that I think is crucial. And of course, to have more like to listen a little bit more what are also the feedbacks of the students or what happened during the mobility? Did they feel included? Did they think also the grants were enough? What do they think about that? Do they feel that they were privileged because maybe some of the friends couldn't go mobility due to uh, other, other problems or other challenges that it faced? So I think that at least a very, very simple answer would be to receive more feedbacks on what is the actually the experience of uh, the students in mobility. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for highlighting that. And I think that is very important and something that we also try to, to continue to include the student perspective in our conferences in everything that we do. So we are very pleased to continue that collaboration and hopefully it will transcend into the, uh, all the institutions around the world. Giorgio, I know that you're monitoring the, the questions, so I think I'll hand over to you to, to, to start the next round of conversation. Yeah, thank you very much, Trine. So we received already some questions and uh, we received quite some from uh, Nizar Naim, and uh, I would like to pick one of them to start with. And is the first question, is she, he or she, I, I don't know, sorry about that, uh, is asking uh, that we are living in a world which is at the same, uh, somebody said that we are living in a world which is at the same time very connected and at the same time very divided. And the question is asking for clarification. Mm -hmm. I have my own uh, opinion on that, <laughs> but uh, I would like, first to hear the, um, the opinion of the speaker. So any of you who would like to start commenting on, uh, on this comment? So it was my statement, so I might start there. Um, so I, you know, I think we've, we saw in the pandemic how one, one event in one part of the world could spread around the world and have a dramatic impact on everyone else We're, on, on, across the globe. We're seeing those sort of connections with climate change. We're seeing all of those uh, impacts, all of, the, all of that interconnectedness um, between different systems um, as well. And yet, uh, at the same time, we're seeing uh, the uh, increasing divisions, divisions between um, democracies and different types of democracies and how they're working. Um, we're seeing increasing tension, geopolitical tension in different parts of the world. So that interconnection and that disconnection is it's disharmonious. It doesn't seem to make any sense. And it, it's, it, it highlights, I think, the divisions between who has and who hasn't got access to certain types of resources at certain times. So in the pandemic, we saw people in um, the global south more dramatically impacted because they didn't have access to the vaccines at, at the same pace or the capacity to distribute them. So, you know, we saw that event create of connectedness, create more division and more disconnection. Thank you very much, Betty. I think Eva would like also to intervene on this topic. Eva, you're muted. Thank you. Just to go a little bit further um, um, on, on the device, divisions, I think we've never seen such divisions within countries as we're seeing today. Um, Perhaps that's a, an overstatement, but I think that the um, social injustices um, that have come forward in both developing between developing countries and, and uh, um, the industrialized countries and within the North, the global North, have have been um, absolutely mind boggling, and they are deep, and they are being fed by something that we have not talked about, and and that is the the social the media, uh, social media and technology that is able to both show the huge differences, 
but also to invent uh, rationales for them and to create dissension by creating distinct realities. And I think the fact that this happened with Mr. Trump in the US um, was in a sense a catalyst for everywhere else. And I think uh, that is something that higher education will have to address both locally um, and internationally. Uh, when today you hear um, Russian people being interviewed uh, about what is happening in the, in, in the Ukraine, um, what they are saying is a completely different reality uh, than what is happening. And so how do we, how do we address that um, is going to be a real challenge. And that is another source of division, both inside the countries and between countries that I think is being um, per not perpetuated, but promoted and facilitated by technologies that we didn't have in the past and that we are not too great at mastering at, the po at this point. Thank you very much, Eva. I think Laverne wants also to intervene on this point. Thank you. Thank you, Giorgio. Uh, I agree completely with Betty. I think we are connected on so many levels. I think social media allows the world to be connected in ways that we've never envisaged before. News goes viral so quickly. Uh, we have news networks that actually give us access to what's going on in the world within minutes. Uh, we have all sorts of platforms where global leaders come together, like the COP events annually, the G7, the G20. And yet it seems that people in hearing more about the rest of the world also take highly divisive individual decisions that are beneficial in a narrow parochial way and not looking at the global good. And it's particularly um, worrying that we are in a world that is so divided and increasingly divided. And I think international education has a very important role to play in shaping a new generation of leaders because we do have a dearth of leadership in the world. And you see it all around the world. One would never have expected there to be three prime ministers in the UK in one year. Um, Ava has spoken about how politics in the US have taken a turn that one would never have expected. And yet, we have all this interconnectedness. I think not only does international education have a role to play, but I think we also have uh, a, a role to play in advocating to current leaders and not just uh, about shaping future leaders because it may take just too long. Um, you know, probably opinion is divided on how effective that sort of lobby can be, but I think it's something we should do as a collective. I also want to speak from the point of view of how we live in this uh, in this gated village and how our borders in different countries are increasingly inaccessible to the others. In Africa, it's so difficult to get a visa to travel to a conference in the global north. I had the unfortunate incident of having to travel to, de to do a keynote address in Canada, and I had a 30 minute layover in the US. And suddenly I needed uh, a visa just to be in the US for 30 minutes and I was turfed off a flight. I had to then stay over at the airport for 24 hours, rebook through a country that would allow me to be in transit. And I got to Canada after a 52 hour door to door travel to present my keynote. And then I heard it was, there was a similar incident with the director general of the HIV AIDS program in Africa being stopped in Switzerland and not being allowed to take her flight to Canada because they, they, there was a feeling that something was not right. And this sort of structural obstacles to us engaging is really serious. And I think it speaks to some of what Divinia spoke about, about how difficult it is for collaboration uh, in, in a world that is, has such unevenness uh, in the playing field. So. Uh, Betty, I think you make a very, very important point, and perhaps it's what we need to be looking at as we look at the horizons of international education going forward. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Laven. Now I would like to move to the question that just arrived because it's for Sara. So it will give also opportunity to Sara to reply. And the question is, uh, is coming from Yan Wang and he's asking you, Sara, to make an example or a case uh, about reintegration of students coming from mobility, I guess. So what can be done by university to support this process of reintegration? Uh, please, Sara, the floor is yours. So first of all, thank you so much for um, for this uh, opportunity. Well, I think um, first of all is that like what happened, for example, I always give examples because this is like I think the best way in order like to reach uh, different universities. Of course, every university is different. But what happened, for example, for me at the local level here um, is that the university actually what they decided to do is to trust students. And this is something that actually seemed um, like, you know, seems like a very um, simple answer. But actually what they, did they do is that uh, they started trusting us as a student organization. So they involved us in the welcome days of the international students. We helped them. We were in the same office as the uh, as the international relations office doing all the support for the students that were coming um, in mobility. And then, of course, after the whole moment that the students also, the students of uh, this university um, came uh, back home because they did a mobility. So the outgoing students came back here. Uh, what did they do? It, what we did is that we actually did a whole event in order like to support them, in order like to gather feedbacks of all their, their mobility. So what did they do? And in that moment, we tried to make them engage more in our student organization in order that they can also give actually what the student, what the Erasmus uh, gave to them, for example, in this experience. So a very, very simple, uh, simple thing that we do is through this, um, this program that we have that is called Buddy System. We match people that did a mobility abroad. So for example, me, I went to Spain, I did my mobility in Spain, and I was matched with a person that actually is going to go on mobility. So with actually not only one, 10 people. So I did a call with these people. I went out, I took a coffee with them, talking about maybe how they could shape their learning agreement, how they could, you know, try to, um, try to, um, make them mobility like a better kind of mobility so not to be super um, like not fearless but you know like in order like to engage more um, when they went to mobility and what happened is that actually um, even though uh, we didn't reach them when they were mobility when they came back they wanted to give back what we did to them so what, when when they give back actually what they wanted is to engage with the students help them so it's like a process that actually it's kind of automatical if you give trust to the students and you try to um make their voice heard by also asking questions what they are doing here now for example is when they need any help in order like to reach international students they ask us for help uh, so we 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 organize events for them we talk about active citizenship for example, now we are doing a campaign for the next uh, European election. So we are trying, you know, to in, to give uh, the students like all the opportunities that they might have. And the university is giving trust to us. So this is basically um, an idea. But of course, there are many, many examples that we can we can say. Thank you very much, Sara. And now I would like to combine two questions. Uh, sorry, I apologize uh, for misspelling already the name. We have a question from Uijiate, uh, which is directed to Eva, but I think it could be answered by any of, uh, of the panelists. And in, in, this is connected with also the first question from an anonymous attendant, which is basically the balance. Eva, in your presentation, you mentioned that University should not work only with similar university, but it should work also with different universities. And the question is, is asking, how can we balance this with more practical needs? Because we need, especially taken from the research technological uh, point of view. Uh, but the, at the same time, this could be valid. How to balance more, let's say, uh, aspirational and more value-based initiatives as we have heard today with we have to face it, the reality that many universities are facing of economic needs that are um, coming through internationalization. So how can we balance these two 
in a way conflicting uh, pressures also coming from outside the institution, but also inside the institution. Eva, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. Um, not an easy, not an easy question, and it's easy to say we should be doing this, but how to do it is much more difficult. But, but at the same time, I think um, yes, it is an issue of balance. But I think in internationalization, um, it's about learning. It's about uh, being exposed to different viewpoints, different ways of knowing different ways of um, learning. So if we only collaborate with partners who are very similar to, to our own institutions, I think we diminish the capacity to, to open our, our uh, faculty, our researchers, and our students to, to the diversity that is out there. What I'm struck by uh, is, though, that we recruit mostly students from um, five countries in the world. Uh, it's quite clear that where our greatest number of students who come for degree purposes come from. And yet, it's not until fairly recently that we also saw the universities in those countries, India, China, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, as potential partners. And I think it's really South Africa um, or any, actually, any African country. They were a source of recruiting uh, students, but they were not seen as potential partners. And yet, in my experience of working with various institutions, every time I've been told that the gains in terms of learning are so much greater when we work with institutions that are different. Um, people are really receptive to um, working. I remember colleagues, this is 35 years ago, 40 years ago, working in China in the medical field, coming back, doctors coming back and saying, we have completely changed our way of um, dealing with patients after our work with the Chinese institution, setting up an oncology center, um, in the northern part of China, changed their medical program and changed the way they trained their students. They could have worked with a European university. They could have worked with um, an American institution. This was in Canada. Uh, they wouldn't have learned as much. So I think it's, it's about recognition that um, we learn from everyone and we sometimes learn a lot more um, when we are working with unlike institutions. Um, so um, I think it is about balancing, but I think it's also about really looking at what it is that we expect internationalization to bring uh, to our institutions and recognizing that it is a two-way co-learning process, not a one-way street. Um, and choosing our partners with that in mind. Thank you, Eva. I think Betty wants to intervene also, on, yeah. and, also and after uh, Laverne. So please, Betty I and just, Laverne. I just wanted to add to that to say that I had a similar experience working with a Malaysian university where we worked as um, we worked on the teaching and learning agenda. We worked on how we approached teaching and learning so that in the Australian institution, we could understand better what the needs were of the Malaysian students that we were we were teaching, but also the curriculum that we were um, exporting to the Malaysian institution, that they could understand the thinking behind that. And in the end, what resulted after three years of funded research into teaching and learning was a different curriculum, one that was different for the Australians, but also different for the Malaysians and better suited everybody's needs. So you can really put that into the field of internationalization and say, well, that's that is part, that's where those those diverse partnerships really work. And I have said to people over directors of international offices often over the pandemic period, when you come out of the pandemic and you're starting to renegotiate your contracts, 
will you consider things like what sort of coil partnerships can we have? Don't just think about mobility partnerships, physical mobility. Think about virtual mobility and think about connecting academics so that they can learn and become more cosmopolitan in their thinking and approach. Laven, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think to add to uh, the points that Ava and Betty have made, I think uh, I, want to, I want to actually really stress the point of how diversity can drive creativity and push the boundaries of knowledge, because it's that difference that adds the um, almost the X factor in taking forward how universities of a particular ilk work. And one of the examples that we had recently, and Betty spoke about the need to use technology, we have focused on collaborative online international learning in all its forms, because you know we now call it international virtual engagement. And we've great, gained expertise in this area. And we won a competitive bid to be the consultants to the Association of Commonwealth Universities. We produced a toolkit that's available to the 500 member universities there. And the University of Western Australia recognized this expertise. They are a research intensive university, but they engaged with us to train their staff in collaborative online international learning. It was the start of a wonderful engagement. It has actually grown to a, a partnership and collaborations that now extend across the university. And that was largely because we brought academics together to talk about things. And this engagement has actually had a number of multiplier effects. The University of Western Australia introduced us to the Matariki Consortium, which is a consortium of nine research intensive universities. This is a group we would never have ordinarily worked with because they work in a particular sphere. But we have, we've done training for these nine research intensive universities. And the engagements between the academics at these universities and Durban University of Technology has spawned another set of partnerships. And I think by breaking these barriers, the richness and the potential of internationalization of, uh, educa of higher education can actually be optimized. We can, we can look at um, the future and the impact of internationalization uh, in ways that we've never imagined before when we had these more constrained approaches uh, to internationalization. So uh, I agree completely. And I think it's probably one of the areas that we as international educators have to drive with far more intensity and commitment. Thank you to, for all the panelists for, for the responses to this question. And Laverne, I would like to uh, jump in here as well and, and pose a question as follow up to, to your and Divinia's presentation, because I thought that there was a very important element in there, because you're calling out and saying, listen, during the pandemic, there was actually a shift in how we started collaborating, like you're saying right now, like the example you're giving of a new form of collaboration. Of course, we also saw the with the pandemic, uh, the high level of inequalities between those who have access to the different devices, data, et cetera, that it requires to actually um, be able to, to connect and exchange. We know the issues of time zones, as Betty was referring to as well. We have exactly the same issue being a global association. But I would like to go back to this article because you were saying that it gave you access in a different way to participate in academic conferences, to be equal in a different way where you're not bound by the obstacles of financing for travel, for visa, for all other kinds of things. And you're saying, be careful, we are actually now returning to how things were before the pandemic. I think Betty was saying the same thing. Her colleagues were eager to go travel again because of course, as humans, we like to meet, we like to exchange. So my question back to you is, what can we do to make sure that we keep this momentum of seeing other forms of collaboration, maybe not as a replacement, but as an alternative, things that can exist, uh, coexist together, I would say, um, what are your thoughts about that? Because I hear 
very strong voice in your article saying we are going backwards now. So what can we do to avoid us going backwards? Thank you. I think the first thing is not to dismiss the lessons that we learned during COVID. We learned some very important lessons during COVID. Yes, lessons that were forced upon us because of circumstances that we could never have predicted. But I think there were lessons that are worth reflecting on. And we were able to be agile. Uh, we were able to be um, responsive in ways that we were never, uh, that we would never have envisaged previously. And I think there were some benefits that came out of it. And in our haste to go back to the old normal, I think we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are important lessons for us to hold on to. There are important uh, positive developments that we need to reflect upon. And part of this was greater access, greater interconnectedness. And if we don't hold on to this greater inter interconnectedness, the balance will shift to what Betty spoke about as being the divisions, because we, could, we, we are simultaneously more interconnected and, and divided. So we need to work on these areas of connection. Um, I think conferences that were hybrid or conferences that went online should actually consider having the online component for those that are not able to access the conference in person. I know many conferences decided that, you know, after three years of being online, they had to go to an in-person version. Many of them uh, might do it for reasons of profit. Others might do it because it's, a, it's hard work running parallel conferences. But I think the benefits far outweigh the investment in having this. Um, and of course, we've got to think about the carbon footprint. Uh, we should not forget about that and our contribution to that. Uh, you know, to the green ecosystems that we speak about so glibly uh, in terms of the SDGs and uh, the work we do uh, around climate change. So yes, uh, we are proposing that the lessons learned to be held on to and uh, for greater access to be given to parts of the world that benefited during COVID and are now finding themselves out in the cold again. Thank you, Laverne. Eva, you wanted to come in here in this conversation as well. Just to say that there are many aspects to internationalization and that some can very easily uh, be done the way we are doing right now, mm -hmm. uh, webinars, but also various planning meetings, various administrative tasks that can be done um, to reduce the carbon footprint notwithstanding the fact that the opportunities we've had, all of us, to meet and to mingle and to, to really discuss things should, cannot um, be, be um, taken away from the next generations. But I think we need to see how to divide some of the work uh, that can be done and how to then use technology to take on some tasks that do not need. I have not been to a day long meeting for the past four years. When it's a day long meeting, we can all sit online and do it that way. Um, conferences where you share research, uh, where you create networks, it's something else. But I think we need to be very, very clear about um, how best to, uh, to reduce the footprint because we can't talk out of both sides of our mouth and we tend to do that very glibly. Betty, uh, please uh, go uh, in as well. And I'll just add just one thing. I think, I mean, I think that one really practical thing and one way in which international education associations could lead in this is they could say we will have a face-to-face -face conference once every two years and a virtual on another. So you would all, you would always have three or four conferences a year virtual and three or four conferences a year face to face. Now, one of the barriers to that will be that they are a major source of funding for those associations. But let's not point the finger at institutions who've gone down the recruitment of international students for funding route and then say, but but we're going to we're going to not bother about the environment and we're not going to bother about the divisions that this creates. We're just going to keep doing things the way we've always done them. Thank you. We are coming to an end. Giorgio, I think we had another question coming in. 
and then we will have to wrap up. Yeah, but <clears throat> I think uh, Sarah is replying to that question uh, in uh, by by typing because okay, we are, are running out of time. Yeah, we are running out of time. Exactly. But thank you for for posing questions. Um, so from my side, I would simply because we are already at the end of our time, I would like to thank very much all the panelists for very inspiring presentation and very lively debate. And I would also like to thank uh, all the participants for having been here until the end, for having posed their questions. And with that, I give back the floor to you, uh, Trine. I already shared the link to IU Horizons in the chat and that maybe you would like the participants to remind that this was kind of just a taste of what they can find in the edition of Horizon. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much, Giorgio. And I would just like to echo you in thanking all the speakers for taking the time to be with us here today to have these conversations. I think that we touched upon a lot of important messages. Uh, and I think that we have to deliberately co-construct the type of internationalization that we want, which is more inclusive, that does not necessarily mean leaving aside mobility, but that means also taking specific decisions on ensuring that the international experience is also something that we can experience within the institutions at home so that we make it a more uh, inclusive process. So thank you for all. And then I invite, of course, all the participants uh, with us here today to download the magazine and to read through all of the 25 uh, very interesting articles uh, that discusses this theme. And then we look forward to continue collaborating with you. So thank you to all of you. Uh, and I think that we will end the webinar here. Thank you. Have a good day, evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.